If a person says to you, tell me how you know for sure that you're saved. Word of God. There you go. Word of God. There is no other way. You can't give your opinion on the matter. If you, if you don't go and understand how it is you have eternal life, then you're never going to have real security. Now, you can get saved and have the security between God and you, but your knowledge of it, that's what strengthens you, okay? So I heard Robert Brock preach on this. And a matter of fact, when we first started Grace School of Bible, we, we had some videos, and uh, Mr. Brock gave us a video that he uh, debated with a Church of Christ guy down here at Skycrest, right down off 78th Avenue, almost at 19. You know where that is? On the left-hand side, where you used to live, you go right down to 19, there's a church back there. Those guys are radical, okay, very radical, just serious uh, Church of Christ guys. And they're master guys in terms of they've mastered the art of debating. And so when the debate began, they asked him how he knew that he was saved. And he fumbled through it, and he said, I just feel like I'm saved. Ding, ding, ding. That's the wrong answer. You see, they nailed him on the very first question, threw him off of his, ba his balance, and he never recovered. Now, he, he doesn't, he's a meek man. He, he didn't do a lot of forceful preaching. But he was a good Bible teacher. But in his life, his understanding of how the Bible came into existence and how it was preserved for us is is strictly old school. It has to do with uh, his education at Philadelphia School of the Bible, and uh, that's all. That that's a uh, that's all Calvinism in that school. And so you you have to be careful where your roots are in terms of how you come to know where your Bible came from. All right. Uh, I explained the issue yesterday in uh, now by faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Uh, well, the, the actual verse in the KJV is the word is charity. And charity is love in action. And I mentioned that. And, and so now abide in faith, hope, and love. But when you get to glory, you won't need faith or hope. All you're going to have is the charity. That's all you need there. And so when you start saying love, you can start talking about a word that people throw around rather loosely. When I was growing up, they spelled it L-U-V. And there's a lot of different ways. That, that was the hippie version. But, you know, the, 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 goofy, the goofy things, people can fall in love with each other and both be lost. Uh, people can love each other or love somebody else and they don't even know it. You know, these things, love is, it, it all starts out with usually a, a look, a fat, infatuation, lust, and whatever. That's how it goes. That's their thinking of love in the world system. But genuine love, in, in the way it, it, it is in the Bible, for us, it has to do with the idea that, that we now are different than we were before we got saved. And we now have a capacity for love. And if you ask me, hey, why do I love my wife? Man, my standard answer is because I choose to. I use my free will to reinforce that. And I don't have to talk myself into that every day. I just decided that's who I'm going to love, and I love her. And it, and it grows. And once it grows so big that you can't get away from it or around it or whatever, then, then you realize that, that love is much, much bigger than just infatuation. Okay? So th those are things you've got to remember. And the Bible is not only the issue, but the Bible issue is still the issue of where this book actually came from. When you read the King James Bible, you read the, the only Bible on the planet that comes from the received text, the Reformation text, and it is the only text on the planet that's correct. God only wrote one Bible. He didn't write 47 of them. He wrote one. And all the other ones are off the, the what we call the Catholic text, the Roman text. And even, it's kind of funny, even if you take a Douay Reims Bible, uh, which is a, the first English Catholic Bible ever translated into English. If you go to Romans chapter 3, it's almost the same as the KJV right down the line. They have more contradictions in their doctrine the minute they put that Bible out 
that they, they, they stopped doing it and they had to go back to the other stuff because what, what they didn't realize, they were just putting out an English Bible and they needed a text to translate from. So two, two men who were Catholic, Roman Catholic sympathizers, they took a 10 year period out of their life and they translated all this stuff and they changed many, many, many thousands of words and, and basically just butchered it is what they did. They took the Receptus and butchered it. So it's no longer called the, the Receptus, it's called the Nestle, Nestle's uh, Greek text or the, uh, well, there's a couple of different terms for it, but the, the, I call it the Catholic text because that's really what it is now. They're, those guys are pure Catholics almost, and, uh, but they, they, were pro they were propagating themselves as what we would consider fundamental products. And they did a they did a terrible disservice, and they were really the launch because their their the revised version of 1881 is the first English Bible that really made any kind of traction, and it didn't really do that well to begin with. It just kind of died off, and then the the, the Americans got mad because they weren't they weren't allowed to do it with them. They wanted it something else, so then they came out with a new you know this newer version, the revised standard version. So, so now they got one over there and they got one over here and then they just started coming. And by the time you get to the early 1900s, they're roasting King James over a fire, calling him a queer, calling him, you know, calling him a, a reprobate. They're calling him everything you could possibly imagine. And, and then they begin to associate the Holy Bible, which is the title of the Bible we have. It's called Holy Bible. That's it. That's its title. They began to associate him with the Holy Bible to make sure people understood, okay? And that's how they degraded the King James and why people started saying, well, this is antiquated. If you want a Bible that's right, it better be antiquated. It needs to be all the way back to the original manuscripts. And, and what we now have as original manuscripts are all copies. So how do you get it back to the original? You don't. God keeps the, the copies preserved so that you always have an original. And that's the way it works. He uses people to do that. That's what the doctrine of preservation is. And so inspiration is one thing, but if you don't have preservation, you don't have a text to, to, to talk about or, or to translate or whatever. So we have the received text. Now, if you want to see the Texas Receptus or the received text in English, you go by yourself the King James Bible, and there it is, properly translated. Uh, the Bible is something that you can trust. Turn to, uh, go back to 1 Kings chapter 17. <coughs> you need to trust your Bible. First Kings uh, chapter 17. write this down if you want, 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 24, last verse, it says, and the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is true. Now you go over to Paul, and he says, hey, you let, you let God be true, and every man a liar. Well, Elijah wasn't a liar because he was a prophet. Now, I'm sure in his natural man, he could, he could have lied many times. But what's the one thing a prophet cannot do in the service of God? And that's a lie, okay? Balaam was one of those. And so you see there, he, said, he says that, she says that, I believe this, that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. And uh, he does, right before she says this, uh, it's because he raises her son from the dead. Fantastic, okay? I mean, when you start getting those sign gifts and you start bringing those sign gifts into play like with the Lord Jesus Christ, when John sends the emissaries to, to ask the Lord, are you really the Christ? This is John's thinking. He's in prison, getting ready to lose his head. Well, naturally, he's not thinking right. So he, he wants to go confirm it. They're cousins, for goodness sake. John was the one that leaped in his mother's womb when... Mary walked into the room with Jesus in her womb. So the two women walk in, both pregnant, 
and John is the one that leaped. And now he's not leaping, he's weeping, okay? He's getting ready to die. And so when you see it, you understand, wow, what did he do? Well, Christ got up, and he began to heal people and do all these things right in front of those emissaries. And he says, you go back and tell John what you've seen. So the credentials of the Lord Jesus Christ are there, and all those credentials go back to King David. Now, here you see an interesting uh, situation there in 1 Kings. It's great. Turn over to uh, uh, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. The Jews have never believed God's word. Now, they are some of them that have and some of them that haven't. But as a nation, they don't, they don't buy it. All they want to do is comment on it. Uh, 17, verse 17. Now, look, let's go down and we'll start in uh, verse... 12, 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. And those that thou gavest me, this is the, the prayer that Jesus is praying in the garden. He says, and I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy filled, uh, joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, talking to his heavenly father, and the world hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He says, I, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil, meaning the evil one or from Satan. And of course, all this time uh, Judas has been embedded in the 12. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And he says this in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. He says, thy word is truth. And God does not lie as men do. And Paul makes a point of this in Titus chapter 1. Go to Titus chapter 1 and you'll see it. It's a beautiful verse. I, I love this verse, and it's very strong. And God cannot lie. God, he is, he, it is impossible for him to lie. Here he says he cannot lie. Look at uh, Titus 1, 2. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. And you know that he cannot lie because Hebrews 6.18 says it's impossible for him to lie. He cannot do it. And he will not do it. Yea, let God be true. That's what he is. And every man a liar. So what you see is you, you begin to see a permanent record of God's words put into uh, a series of books that are put together. And, and the, the Hebrew Bible is put together with 24 books, our, ours here is put together with 39 books. So what you have is you have a, Jew, a Jewish Bible and a Gentile Bible. Now, do they contain the same information? Absolutely the same. They, they contain exactly the same information, but they're put together on a, in a slightly different way. And uh, there's really just, you know, m there are minor issues. Like we were just reading in the book of Kings, First Kings, they didn't have that, those two books. They had one book called Kings. They had one book, you know, that would be, have a single title on it. If you look at the book uh, of the prophets, we call, they call the minor prophets. It was just called uh, the prophets. Uh, they had 12 books in that one book. Well, we would call it maybe 12 chapters, you would say, the way we write books today. Okay. So when you start to look at First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, all those things get consolidated, and it ends up with 13 times 3, which is 39. Now, 13 is an important, word, uh, important number for Gentile. And so, when you look at the Old Testament, the Gentile Bible we use is 13 times 3 equals 39 books. But Israel has 12 uh, times 2, which is their major number, and it equals 24 books. Okay? They're all the same. Now, their Old Testament ends with Second Chronicles. 
And it ends with a blessing looking forward to the kingdom over there. Whereas the Gentile version, our version, it ends in Malachi, and it ends with a curse. Now, aren't the Gentiles cursed? They've been cursed since... Well, they, they've been cursed since the Exodus, really. And there were exceptions. People were able to get into Israel. Really, you could cross the line in. But as a national entity, what does Paul tell you in Romans 1? He gave them up, he gave them up, and he gave them over. And uh, go to the book of Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah 15. Some people don't want, they don't want you to read out of Romans because they don't want to uh, get into the gender issue in Romans 1. And that, uh, those verses in Romans chapter 1 are, uh, they're on the radar of all the, the, the gay community. Everybody, okay? They don't want you to go there. And they know the verses, uh, so they can recognize it that all they can do is <laughs> uh, essentially just try to deny it. Uh, okay, Jeremiah 15. Now this is just a, you know, you've got kind of an off-the-cuff off the kind of verse. Pretty important, but I like it. This is what it says. Uh, Jeremiah 15, 16. He says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. So you see that he has this opportunity here. To, to say, hey, I found them. I got a hold of them. They're mine, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna read them. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna devour them. Have you ever devoured a book and couldn't put it down? It's a great feeling, isn't it? And when you're so interested in it. Uh, if you go back into, uh, go to Jeremiah, I believe it's maybe in the first chapter, <clears throat> and he says this. Uh, God speaking here in verse. Four and five. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, This is Jeremiah. He says, Before I formed thee, this is God talking to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly. Now, how many, how many people do you think would look at that and say, That can't be true? That God knew who he was forming in the belly of his mother. Now, it's a simple phrase. I mean, most people would read right over it. But when you see him saying, before I formed thee in the belly, God says, I knew thee. Well, how did he know him if he wasn't made? Well, he, he has foreknowledge, okay? He knew him all the way from the formation in the belly, all the way. But who does he say <coughs> does that? Before, he says, I formed thee. Who formed the baby in the belly? Well, you say, well, it's a process biological process. That biological process is patented. The creation process is patented. The judgment process is patented. It all belongs to God. And if he says it, then you need to believe it. So he says before thee, he says before, he says I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. So now you see him being sanctified inside the womb. So what do you think happened when John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb, in Elizabeth's room, womb, when Mary walked in with the Messiah in her? In her? I mean, that's kind of funny because she was in Christ at the time. She was a believer. She was in Christ, but Christ was in her. But that was literal. So Christ was in her spiritually and literally. And she's been entrusted with having this baby. And I'm sure that she had no idea this was going to happen. You know, she just walks into the room and her cousins are pregnant three months more along than she is. And that baby jumps. Now, do you think that's a coincidence? Because of what? I mean, this falls into the same category 
of signs, miracles, and wonders because the Jew requires a sign, and that's exactly what that is. The first time a human being, male, has ever been born without the aid of a human father. And you, you see, it's just, it's just these, these ideas that people get in their head. You go to Romans chapter 1. You take, remember that verse there in Jeremiah. Just remember Jeremiah 1. You go to Romans 1, what does he say about it? I had somebody recently ask me about this subject, about the gender issue. There's so many genders because they just started putting the issue on the license, uh, the, the driver's license. You know, you have male, female, and now X. They just put X. They won't actually give it a title. They just say X. You're the X man or the X woman. <laughs> but really, they don't, want, they don't want you to say woman or male or man. They are trying to outline, they're, they're trying to, to outlaw, <clears throat> make it illegal through their speech that it's not right to say ladies and gentlemen. Or boys and girls. We have a problem with that PE class. Yeah. Dress right. up. Now. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it's very that. easy to solve the problem. You just bring one of each out naked, and we'll just see if you got a question about what's what. You see, like my grandpa used to tell me, and my dad used to pass that on to me. He said, Russ, it's a definite fact that if you don't have any children, if your parents don't have any children, neither will you. You ask somebody about the gender question, and they talk about this, and they say, they say, well, that's not, that's not proper. I say, who says it's proper or not proper? The Word of God makes it really clear. Male and female created he what? Them. And then where did that, where did he come from? She came from the man. They hate that kind of thinking. So when the, when the human being wants to go back to being something other than what they're made, what they're originally created as, notice what God says in verse 24 of Romans 1. He says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. That's just the typical thing that goes on between people. Uh, sinful, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Now that's a pretty serious accusation. And worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen, he says. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Now here's what vile affections are. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against what? Nature. It's not natural. He says, and likewise the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men, that, that just means here it is, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or fitting. Now, what do they receive? Well, they receive the natural consequences of doing those kinds of things. And as a result, he says, there is absolutely no, I mean, this comes straight out of Leviticus 18, 1 to 30, and it's not, it's not something that's to be compromised on. People say, well, if I go talking like this in public and saying things like this, they're going to try me for hate speech. <laughs> well, I tell you what, um, what they're saying against the word of God is far greater than hate speech. It's hell speech. And it's going to send them there. Okay. So as you, as you begin to think about some of these issues about how people are going to think about your Bible, remember this, that the word of God is absolutely true in every aspect. But you have to know where to find that, okay? And it's not found in modern Bibles today. It's corrupt, they're corrupted. And uh, it's a problem and it's just something you gotta deal with. Turn over to Mark chapter one.
It scares people to talk about these things. That's why they don't want to even mention it's, it is a curse to them to be told those things. They hate it. And, uh, and they don't want to hear it. And they don't think they can be cured. Okay. So that's a problem. Uh, what did I say, Mark? Wrong book. Sorry about that. Uh, Mark chapter 1. So Mark chapter 1 says this in verse 2. Uh, it says, we'll read verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, how many verses are quoted in verse 2 and 3? How many? Well, there's two. Okay. All right. So the first one is Isaiah 40. Go ahead and turn there. Isaiah 40. And the next one is Malachi 3.1. Okay. So we'll do Malachi 3.1. Now, this can be done with a lot of different a lot of different verses. So Isaiah 40, verse 3 is quoted, and Malachi 3, 1 is quoted. Now, when you quote both of them, and they're clearly quoted right here, and you say that this represents what? Who are they attributed to? In the modern Bibles, who do they attribute the, the two verses to? Isaiah, right? Why? Why does Isaiah get the credit for Malachi 3 1 in their mind? In modern Bibles, they all say the same thing. The prophet Isaiah, okay? But you're reading Malachi 3 1. Well, why does Malachi get the short end of the stick on this? He's a minor prophet. And the minor prophet, it doesn't hold the same weight as, as the other prophet does. Well, where do they even get that idea? That's ridiculous, okay? Everything Malachi said is the word of God, and everything Isaiah said is the word of God. So how do you how do you take him and say, well, he's just a minor prophet? No, the minor prophets, they were prophesying in 12 books things that were more interior and more insulated and more about the nation of Israel's time in the kingdom program, and it, it, it's not great sweeping things of prophecy like Isaiah wrote. And everybody today is trying to, to try to show you that the, the, the book of Isaiah is a is a, uh, in a miniature version of your holy Bible. 66 books, 66 chapters, blah, blah, blah. You know where that goes? It goes to the trash heap. They're not, they're not understanding the mystery, therefore they, they're trying to figure out how Isaiah is a picture of the New Testament. That's where they're at, okay? Because some dumb bunny said that, and they started believing it, okay? Uh, so Isaiah's out, okay? Malachi's in. And we're going to leave Isaiah there because he's still in it as well, but he's not, he's not in it as the primary only person that said this. It is done by two people, and what does your King James say? The prophets, right. Now, which one do you think is the best translation there? I think it's the prophets. I think it's natural. And it's in the right text. And it's in the right Bible which you're holding in your hand right now. So when you try to take this and say, well, somebody says, well, the Bible has mistakes in it. You're right. If you've got a modern Bible, it's got lots of mistakes in it. This Bible has contradictions for you. It has things that you will not understand right away. It has things that seemingly contradict until you can actually put the verses together and then it comes out and says, oh, I understand, just like we just did. Okay? But if somebody says the Bible's full of errors, you say, yeah, let me show you one. But the real answer when people say that, that you should give them is, well, I'm not surprised because all men are sinners. And so I totally agree with you on that part of it, that all men are sinners. So, 
if you think that all men are sinners and all men that are sinners are incapable of doing this, you're wrong because God used sinners to write this entire book. Saul the sinner, Paul the boaster. Does he use him to write 13 epistles of Paul? You know why it doesn't matter whether the guy's a sinner or not? Because the guy's not going to write the book. God's going to write the book through him. That's what being a sanctified vessel is. That, that you know, when you pick up a cup to get some coffee, you're not the cup. You're just going to use the cup. And so these men are used and it, it works out in a, such a way that God can use the personality of that person, the, the working knowledge that that person has, that person's education. Everything about that man can be used. And therefore, you can actually identify books in the Bible just by the language. Oh, I know who that is. That's Paul's writing. Or that's Peter's writing. And the more, the more a man writes, the more he gets a style laid out and people look at him and they go, that's Paul. Okay. So you need to understand something about people. When you get a guy that says men are sinners and I don't believe the Bible because men are wicked, mean, evil, nasty things. I agree. So now we agree on one thing. You need to say it. And you can take him right to Romans 1 and you can show him all those indictments. Turn over there to Romans 1. The indictments against him. He just now put the rope around his neck. And he just hung himself. By saying that he agrees with the word of God. And before you can get saved. You have to know you're lost. And a lot of people are on that edge. All the, I mean people are upset with humanity. They're upset with society. They're upset with everything. And they think it's all just going to pot and all that. Well. It went that far with Adam and Eve. The world, the world did not, the world did not fix itself because it couldn't. Look at uh, Romans chapter one, and you can see this. You start in verse eighteen and go to verse thirty-two. And so you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 verses. Okay? In 14 verses, you've got 43 counts of sin against humanity. 43 in 14 verses. Now that's pretty impressive. So I suggest you go home and try to, try to write all 43 of them down. Just mark them. Okay, because some of them are, they're kind of, they're so mixed together that you've got to be careful, okay? But there is a lot of them there. If you turn over to chapter 3, you'll see the same exact thing, only instead of putting out the 43 indictments against the Gentiles only, Paul goes through in chapter 2, the second half of chapter 2, and part of them in the early part of chapter 2, too, but the, the, it's, if you put that into cutting that book, uh, that chapter into two pieces, uh, about the second half of the book is really providing you with the charges and indictments against the nation of Israel. And much more for them because they, they had the word of God. They're, they're the ones that were the most responsible people on the planet. And, and they, they had the whole thing. And they actually end up with this question at the end of it. When you get down to uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 29, and Paul says this beautifully, he says, But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter, meaning the law, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Wow, what a great, what a great comment on everything that's been going on so far. He just straightened his own nation out with one verse, including himself. Circumcision is not something... Uh, that they think it is, it's not like a club or whatever. It's it's that of the heart. It is the casting away of your old man, the flesh. That's what it's about. That's what circumcision is. It's a picture of that. Cast away the flesh. You can get by without it. Cut it off and throw it away. And God, he, he, he gives that to a man for that purpose. 
and it starts to make a distinction between Jew and Gentile. Now, it helps do that. But look at what he says in, in verse 1. Now, he's anticipating these questions that are coming at him, and here's what he says. This is what the Jews would say to him. Now, you say, well, how does Paul know what they're going to say? Well, God, the Holy Spirit's given it to him. They're going to ask you this. They're going to say this, okay? He says, what advantage then hath the Jew? Are you kidding me? What advantage? This is the wall. It's up, and you're on the side with God, and the Gentiles are down here, and they're not on the side of God. What advantage do you have? What advantage is there, he says, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? The answer in verse 2, 3, 2 says, much every way, he says chiefly, because that unto them were committed the what? There you go. The prophet and the jewels of the whole religious system that they were under could have been run completely different if they would just read their books. What did they do? They've got one, they've got one set of books over here, and they're this high, and they got about ten stacks this high with their commentary on what that really meant. You know what kind of people do that? People that want to read what they say into that. And they forcibly put their commentary over it, and they try to make it their own. And boy, I tell you, when Jesus Christ quotes, he quotes the Old Testament scriptures when he's in his ministry, and he quotes those guys as well. But he'll never attribute their saying to the word of God. When he says, as it is written, that's the word of God. But when he says, you have heard of them of old, meaning these, these clowns that are trying to, to aggravate the whole nation and keep them all stirred up. Well, the whole thing ended in, in after Solomon died. The whole thing ended in complete and total civil war. And uh, both the north and the south were, were fighting against each other. The northern ten tribes against Judah and Benjamin in the south and Jerusalem. And the whole war raged. And what happened was... They began, these guys in the northern part of it, when they went through this here during David's time, they, they, uh, they actually just completely went off the rails into idolatry. This, this full-blown jump in the deep end of it. And you know what God said? You like this so much, I'm going to give you some of the real thing. You guys are going to Babylon. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he's in the land during this whole time. His life is where he, you see a prophet live through the entire period of time it took to get all those Jews down to Babylon. They didn't go all go at one time. But they came down and ransacked the, the temple of Jerusalem, Solomon's mm -hmm. temple, and then they carried all that stuff off to Babylon. Then they came back two years later and they got another load and they just kept taking them away and into captivity. The they Syrians, owed God a debt. The Syrians were normal. So yes. That, yeah, the Syrians, well, the, 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 when you see the image in Daniel, you see how the thing plays out. It starts out with Nebuchadnezzar, and then it goes to the two kings, and then it goes to the Grecians, and so forth. And so you see how this all works itself out to where in Romans chapter 3, as he starts moving towards the conclusion, and he's going to start that first big slam of, of where the gospel is. And it begins with a time... Uh, a term of time in verse 21. 321 says, but now. So everything you read up to 320 is condemnation, 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 condemnation. And when you get to verse 21, you've got the greatest answer to condemnation you could ever have. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. And, by the way, it's been witnessed by the law, because they had it for 1,500 years, and the prophets that prophesied against <laughs> their idolatry, against their disobedience, and so forth. So 1,500 years of not only them doing all these bad things, but the prophets are recording it, and that's what your Old Testament is. is the is the, the downfall of the nation of Israel. And it concludes right here. There are, uh, there are four, there are four, 490 year periods in Israel's history. And that begins all the way back to Abraham. Okay? So in the history of Israel, as a nation from Egypt, there's four 490 year periods. The last 490 year period isn't completed, it's only been completed 483 years. Right? So if you 
you got 490 minus 483, what do you got? You got seven. seven so where would you find that on the chart? There it is. The seven years, that's, they're, they're being held in advance. That seven years is supposed to be over here. Yes. Now, the dispensation of grains has made a buffer between those two, and something else is being done. So these 483 years aren't really, really either, by the way. They are concluded on the very week, day, uh, day of the week, excuse me, that Jesus Christ rode in Jerusalem on the pole and Acts. Palm Sunday, that we call Palm Sunday, that was the day that that 483rd year, the last day of it, took place. Now, after that day, there's a new clock running. And so now we've got a run up. And, and it's interesting to me that he extends the year out all the way out. They get a year of extension. And you know why they got that year of extension? Because the apostles asked for it. And that was that's a fascinating thing. So when he starts adding, adding to this, you say, well, okay, if that's 483 years, uh, when he comes into Jerusalem, right before the week of, of the crucifixion, then this must be part of what's going on over here. Absolutely. And there's going to be a period here. You notice there's a little gap there? There's going to be some more time for this thing to go. It goes right to the edge here, and it's going to take up right there. Okay? And he's going to, and he's going to make sure that, that that seven years is exact because he tells you that, and of course, their days are 300, their years are 360 days, right? Per year. So if you take seven years, three and one half years, you know exactly how many days it is. And that's printed publicly in your Bible now. And so the people that are involved in this program over here, they're going to know exactly when the tribulation is going to begin. They know exactly when the great tribulation is going to begin. And they'll know the exact day that he's going to come. Now, if there are any adjustments in that, that's his business. I don't know anything about it. Okay? All I know is that there's there's a real tight clock that this thing runs on. And yet, when you have a gap in between, like in a football game, it's okay to stop the clock and do something different. That's what he's doing. We're in the halftime period. Parenthesis. Yeah, we're in a parenthesis. And, and it, it works out great. And in this parenthesis, we've got some attributes. Go back to 1 Timothy. Um, it's time to stop. 1 Timothy chapter 1, we have some attributes that, I don't mean personal attributes, but I'm saying we have, there are some benefits, I should say it that way, in the dispensation of grace that are tremendous. And you've got to take advantage of these and understand them. And that's because things aren't happening in the dispensation of grace the same way they've been happening back here. There is no wall up anymore, and the Gentile nations have not been given up today. God is not working on the nations or raising up nations and tearing nations down. What he's doing is he's up here in holy exile, and he's dead silent. Read Silence of God. It's one of the greatest books you'll ever read. It's one of the biggest Alarms that rings without any noise. Is it why is God so silent? Well, because he's doing something that's completely different and it doesn't require him to speak, except through Paul. And so he gives the thing so exclusively to Paul that when Peter gets the idea of, or the, the vision and so forth about Cornelius, he doesn't even get it from Jesus Christ. He gets it from an angel. You see... He did not talk to anybody except the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and I'm talking about Paul. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ didn't talk to anybody else either. Now, when it comes to the revelation that, that goes on with this period we're now in. Now, this is important. Look at what we have available to us. Now, this is strictly a... From a... From a comparison standard, you would want to go back to Romans chapter 13 and look at how we deal with our government system today. Okay? How do you deal with governments, right? Well, here's what he says about it here. This is a little bit more advanced. 
in chapter 2, he says, I exhort therefore to Timothy that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he goes into verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority. So what should the people be doing in the country today with their president? What should they be doing? They should be praying for him. And they should be encouraging him. If you, if you had a guy come out and get in your aircraft and he's going to fly your aircraft, would you spend the whole flight yelling and screaming and calling him names and doing all that stuff? No. You'd leave him alone and encourage him. Okay? He says, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead. Now, here's the key. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. In honesty. You want godliness to function at its highest level? You want honesty to function at its highest level? Who's going to bring it to that level? The kings that are in authority aren't going to do it. They're so greedy that they, they think gain is godliness. Yes. The, the churches today are built around the model that the more we've got, the more God's blessing us. Yeah. No. When Paul, Paul says when you meet people like that, he says from such turn away. Get away from them. <laughs> because they have confused this whole idea of gain and godliness, they're, they're not the same thing. And God is not sitting in heaven blessing you with financial reparations for your wonderful position as a human being on planet Earth. He's not raining money down on you. People that get into these things and start doing all these things and try to make themselves look big like God's doing all this, guess what? They're, they're footing the bill themselves. And they're paying for all that stuff, and they lie about it and call it God's blessing. Well, show me where you, where you get the idea that that's a blessing from God. Now, I know the people that give the money to the church help with it, so forth. They make donations. I understand that. But the point is, they take all that money, and what do they do? They put it all together. Oh, this is from God. And they go invest it over here in the wrong part of the program. And they promote a system of failure. If they did that over here, and I've never seen it done because there's a very few great churches that ever had anything. I think Mr. O'Hare probably had the largest church in the country at about 800 people. And that was only for 25, 30 years. We're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars going into these systems. And they're putting themselves out on TV. They're putting themselves out there, you know, on, in, in all these other things and activities. And they say... Look at how much God's blessing us. No, no, we're to lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He's telling Timothy, this is your ministry here, not the ministry over here in 2 Timothy 4. He's talking about your ministry and how you're supposed to do what God says in this dispensation. You know, this is not like the roaring falls where the water's just pouring over. This is just a trickling, and it's happening ever so slow through the dispensation of grace. And God is going to patiently allow everybody that is going to believe the gospel of the grace of God. And he knows the exact number right down to the exact person. And when that last person gets into the body of Christ, the body of Christ is going out of here because there's nothing else for it to do. Okay? He goes out. And it's gone. I mean, there is no more going and making more body members. That day will come. It would be interesting to see that from God's perspective. Wouldn't it be interesting to see everything from his perspective? You can. Right here in these books. Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. And he, he says, everything that God wants you to know, he's already given it to you. Just read it. You know... The dispensation of grace is going to come to an end. And when it comes to an end, you're going to effectively, temporarily, see the end of that book right there. After this is over, and they start into this, there's no need for the book there. The 144,000 will have the Word of God, but they'll have it inside of them. And they're not going to need to go running around with a King James Bible. The printed, published Bible will be very hard to get during this time right here. They've had their time. Matter of fact, 2 Thessalonians talks about the, re the revenge that God's going to take on all these people in the dispensation. Grace who come their nose at that Bible.
Bible and the idea of being saved by grace through faith. Oh, it's terrible. Read First Thessalonians one. It's or Second Thessalonians chapter one. You see it. I mean, it, it, it is just what God's going to bring on these people. And who are those people? Those are the people who live on your street and my street and all the way around the world and us, near us and everything. They, all these people here that are into other religious systems and everything, you know what's going to happen to them? They're going to burn right there. And most of them die in the first half because people think, well, the, the whole thing is not wrath. The first half uh, is, uh, is, is not that way. And we get these guys called... Um, um, well, they, they call themselves by different things, but they, they, they talk about pre-wrath rapture. They want, to make, they want to make us go halfway in, and then we get pulled out right when the shooting starts. You know the shooting starts right here. Matter of fact, it's going on today all over the earth anyway. But it starts right here, but that's between the nations. The shooting that starts here in the middle of the week, that comes from God. And there is no... There, there are, there's not going to be anything going on. When the tribulation begins, it's like a hailstorm, which, as a matter of fact, it technically is. There are hailstones, 60 pounders. And when you start seeing hailstones the size of a bowling ball weighing 60 pounds mingled with fire and brimstone hitting these glass buildings, you know what's going to happen? Nobody's going to Bible study tonight. <laughs> They're not going to Bible study because they got no Bibles, okay? They hate God that much. And when he shows his face and his kingdom comes down into the heavenly places and we're installed in all those things and, they, and those things come down and every eye shall behold him and they're going to look at that kingdom of heaven and it's going to come down there and it's going to hang there and they're going to see it and they're going to yell things out like hide us from the wrath of the Lamb and we, don't, we can't deal with this. And they want to die. They want to kill themselves. And he says, death shall escape them. They're not going to be able to die. You know why? They don't have to go to hell. Hell's been opened up and brought up here. And they won't be able to escape it. They're going to take their punishment that they would have received in hell had they lived in another age. They're going to start receiving it on earth. And this is the nations. So you understand why it's important for some of these nations to help Israel? So that they, they, they get help during that time and they they get the ability to walk into the kingdom when it's over. But all those who fought against Israel and tried to destroy Israel, you see the group of them right now around them. You see it. It's terrible. All of this because they won't believe a book that they never read. You gotta read it before you can understand it, right? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. We thank you that, that we have a book that we can trust. And we can trust it with our eternal life. And we thank you for it today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.